Well, good morning, Exalt, and everybody here, and as well as our online campus. We appreciate having you tune in with us today as we study the God's Word. It's been a very great morning here already with the worship, with our praise to, to our God. Let's bow before him and pray again, please. Father, how we look to you, Father, right now for your comfort, for your strength, for your wisdom. Father, as we seek to open your word, as we seek to know just what you have for each and every one of us. Father, we know that in our, in our midst here, Father, this morning, there are people that may have just come in and because they just want to see what we're all about. And Father, we are thankful for that. We're thankful that they've come. We're thankful that they've come to hear your word. Father, we thank you for those that have regularly come that understand the importance of being regularly fed from the word of God. We praise for that. And Father, we pray for those individuals today that have not yet chosen to follow Christ. I pray that the Spirit of God would pierce hearts today, cause us to understand your truths, and then respond to them in, in obedience. Father, may you use everything that is said and done this day to bring glory to your Son, Jesus Christ, for we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Through the years, my wife and I have enjoyed watching on TV trial dramas. I don't know if any of the rest of you have done that or not, but I'll show you my age now when I said we used to watch Perry Mason, <laughs> Matlock, and we also like to watch a bull, you know, sort of a current day, sort of bull situation there. And sometimes we've even watched 48 Hours. I'm not a big fan of that, but sometimes we watch that as well. But see, the storyline always comes down to where the individual that has been uh, alleged to have a crime, determining whether they're convicted or they're not convicted because whether they're guilty or not. And it, with it always comes some kind of twist and turns, much like some of the things that we find in Nehemiah chapter 9. That's going to be our text this morning. Nehemiah chapter 9, we'll have some verses on the screen for you to be able to follow along. But in this, Nehemiah uh, has been sent by the king um, to go back to Jerusalem after Jerusalem had been taken off into captivity in Babylonia, and he was sent back there to help build up the walls for protection for the nation, for the city itself there in Jerusalem. And as he was doing that, God blessed and honored the people, and they found the law of God. They found it. You'd think they were God's people. How would they not find the law of God? It had been buried because of disobedience of the people. And they found the law of God, and they started reading it, and Nehemiah said, this is what we've got to do. We've got to get back to what God's word has to say. And so what we find in Nehemiah chapter 9 is the instruction being given by Ezra the priest and also the Levites to the nation of Israel. And they're, they're teaching what God's word has to say. And they come across and they, they show, let me, let me just read to you a verse that you don't have on the screen. It, they said, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you just preserve all of them and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord. They acknowledged that God was the true God. And in the process then, they went on to recount the calling of Abraham. In verse 8, it talks there about uh, the calling of Abraham. His name was Abram. He was brought from the Ur of Chaldees. And when they was brought there, that is currently we would think of Iraq. This is the location where that was. He was brought down and he was told by God, I will bless you and your descendants will be greater than all the numbers of the stars ahead in heaven. God blessed him in that respect and honored. And then in verse 9, it says that God kept that promise by providing for Israel that he delivered Israel out of captivity, or not captivity, but the slavery of Egypt. And as he continued to do that, God just continued to uh, shower his goodness upon them in protection. Then we, then we read about in verse 12, and you know the story about the Red Sea, 
they approached the Red Sea and God divided the sea, divided the sea so that his people could walk across and not be wet and be protected. And then Pharaoh's army came after, came after them. And of course, they all got drowned. You know, there was the song says, Pharaoh's army got drowned, you know. They, they were gone. So we find that God's goodness was always following Israel. Also, in verse 15, it says that God miraculously covered, cared for them all the time that they were traveling to the promised land that God had promised to Abraham because he provided food and water miraculously out of a rock. He got water. He sent manna down from heaven every morning. They didn't have to go out, except they had to go outside their home and, and gather it and eat it. I mean, God provided miraculously for this, for this nation. Yet for all the goodness for the people of Israel, in verse 16, it says, their fathers acted presumptuously. Do you use that word very much, presumptuously? I never have. <laughs> I never have used it. But I'll tell you what some renderings of, of that is, that they, re, the elders refused. They literally refused to listen to what God, God had to say. They became arrogant, stiff-necked. You know, the reason for that is because they thought they had a better way, a better way than God. Imagine the audacity of saying that. But how many people have said the same thing in your own hearts? Uh, I had a man in, in my church when I was pastoring in Illinois some years ago, more years than I want to remember. But he came up to me one day and he said, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I said, sure, come on in. So we came in and sat down and we started talking. He says, I know what the Bible has to say, but anytime you hear that, get ready for excuses why people don't have to obey what God says. And he says, I know what the Bible has to say, but he said, this is what I want to do. And I looked at him and I said, and you want me to give you permission to do what God doesn't want you to do? I said, no way, Jose. <laughs> I said, there's no way because God's word is not something that we can take and compromise with. God's word is God's word for us, for our benefit, for our blessing, for our strengthening. But so the nation of Israel continued to refuse to obey what God had to say. And they even constructed a God of their own making. Remember the golden calf that they, they built? Because Moses had, was up on the mountain and he'd been up there 40 days. They thought he was probably dead. You know, they thought, what's going on with this guy? So he's not coming back. So we're going to get to create a God of our own. And it's interesting what the scripture says there that this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Talk about stupid. But you know what? We do a lot of stupid things in our minds. We do a lot of stupid things in our, in our thinking. And they were, fell right into that. They were, in a sense, they were going back to Egypt, going back to Egypt, trying to think about all the different things that Egypt provided for them, and even the false gods that Egypt had there. But then notice with me God's goodness. Even after they've done all this, God's goodness in verse 21. All the years that they were in the wilderness, the wilderness wanderings, this says their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Folks, you talk about miracles. Now, 40 years and your clothes don't wear out? That was the original wash and wear, you know. It was the, it was the, it was the type of clothing that God preserved. Now, I'm sure they washed it. I'm sure they had to wash it several times. But my goodness. And then the feet that do not swell. If anyone has children, you know, every six months, you've got to buy new shoes because the feet keep growing, right? So, man alive, I don't know how God did that with the, with the shoes, with their sandals. You know, use your imagination. I could just see those, those kids' feet that are starting to grow, and they're not going to swell, the scripture says. But maybe that sandal just 
automatically just grew with it. I don't know, but that's possible, right? Because they didn't, they did not swell. They had pres those, uh, they were preserved all the way through by God, the supernatural clothing manufacturer, and also the heavenly grand marshal, because later it, it goes on to tell us that he enabled, uh, God enabled Israel to conquer the promised land of, of Israel that had all kinds of some of some of some giants there and some uh, big uh, nations and countries there that they were not they were hostile to the whole things of, of the things of God. And they, they were able to capture cities with lush fields of olive orchards and fruit trees. And they allowed the nation to become fat and happy as they sort of delighted in all the blessings that they received. But then it, look at verse 26. However, they continue to rebel against God, even killing the prophets that God sent to them to, to give them God's messages. And they spouted off contemptible blasphemies against God. They accused God. God, you're not a good God. God, if you really were, you'd, you'd take care of us better than this. You know, and I think when God had probably pretty much almost had it, God allowed invading armies to come in and to overrun their borders and to put them into slavery, enslave them themselves. But every time, every time, Israel cried out in faith and in repentance. God answered. Do you hear me? Every time God answered and he provided for them a rescue to, to help them out of their mess. Then in verse 28, it says, after a period of rest, they continued time and time again to incur the displeasure of God. Folks, it was one cycle after another. They'd have one good king and one bad king. And then one king would lead them in righteousness in the nation. And then they would, they blow it. Sound familiar? <laughs> Sound familiar? See, many years in verse 30, the scripture says, you bore with them and you warned them by your spirit, yet they would not give ear. Israel wouldn't listen to the voice of God wouldn't listen to the voice of God. Do you think Israel might have been weary of this seesaw, half-hearted faith? I would think they might have gotten sort of weary of that, but then also realize, but God is faithful. God has provided for us. God will take care of us. One of my wife's favorite movies is The Help. And yes, we might have watched it a zillion times in our home. Every time it's on and she's able to get the clicker, you know, she grabs the clicker back for me. But she'll gr grab the clicker and she'll get onto that. She loves to watch that. See, the story is situated in the Deep South in the 60s. And it's about the treatment of the black women who would keep house for their more well-off white householders. Viola Davis was a maid uh, in the movie, named Abilene, and she played a major role throughout the movie, and she had a, a memorable dialogue for me with one of the householders who was continuously insulted and demeaned her and the other uh, fellow sisters that worked as housekeepers, and she said to Miss Hilly one day, Miss Hilly, you is a godless woman. Ain't you tired, Miss Hilly? Ain't you tired? I'm wondering if God didn't say to Israel at times, ain't you tired, Israel? Ain't you tired of, of this up and down and up and down? See, this is only a portion of Israel's history that Ezra gave there. Um, there was more of the God's history that, uh, that continued on in, into the New Testament as well. But we are only wanted to see particularly how Israel's guilt was confirmed time and time again, yet in God's mercy, in his faithfulness, he determined he would be faithful to them. Look at verse 31. Uh, if you've got your Bible there, you've got it. It's not on the screen. It says, nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them 
or forsake them, for you are a gracious and a merciful God. Have you ever wondered why did God reveal all of Israel's bad stuff in the Bible? Did you ever think about that? Boy, you want to read something that's downright dirty. I don't mean dirty. I don't mean that. But downright um, dysfunctional. Read the Old Testament, right? So the Old Testament tells us as it is, as it was. It doesn't pull any punches. And, and I've wondered many times, God, why didn't you do that? Well, you know, the New Testament has an answer for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, it says, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Wow, isn't that something? It says, Israel was a picture for you folks, for the church in the New Testament, and for all of us here today, a picture so that we might not follow their example. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. Now that word instruction is a word that means also to admonish or to warn, to exhort. And so therefore, all these things happen to exhort us, to exhort us to not follow after their disobedience, their unfaithfulness to God. See, in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatever was written in the former days, and these are all similar verses, was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. God's, God said, I recorded all this information so that you can have hope. Israel had hope because they, they trusted in a God who knew everything. And he says, I've written all this. This has all been recorded for you so that as a church, as a, as a body of believers, you can have hope in the encouragement and in the comfort of what the word of God has to say. And folks, we need that comfort every day of our lives. We need to know what God says over what everybody else says. God wants us to know we can have hope, but we need to be aware of his displeasure when we sin. Of, of what that does to us. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. What does it mean to fall away from God? Well, first of all, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean being cast away from his eternal love. That's not what it means. But rather, it means not wanting to hear his voice because I have a better way. I know what you say, God, but I think my way's better. I know what you say in the scriptures about marriage, but my way's better because it's what I, how I feel good about. See, when I do that, I lose that close fellowship with God. That's why believers are come to call to, to come along a side of us. That's what it says in verse 13. Exo but exhort, admonish, warn one another every day as long as it is called today. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. We're to be encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to be reaching out and saying, hey, you're going the wrong way, buddy. Can we help you? Let's, let's teach you what the word of God is. And when our pastor stands here and preaches the word of God and, and it, it, like it sort of hits and it sort of it hits a nerve, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do because the spirit of God uses that. And the spirit of God uses God's people to come alongside and say, hey, let us help you. Let us help you get, get on track with God. Let us help you do what God's word has to say. That's what the apostle, um, what Hebrews is, is talking about here. And it says, exhort one another. We have obligation to reach out to people in sin, reach out to people that are making wrong choices, 
so that they will not be, develop a hardened heart. See, a hardened heart comes because sin is a monster. It's, it creeps in, disguising itself as something good, but it's a, it's a cruel monster that hardens our hearts and to God and to his people. That's why God warns us to make sure that we really listen to his voice. Three times in Hebrews 3 and 4, he tells us, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Three times. Today. Folks, I believe there's an urgency with that. There's an urgency. He says, today, not tomorrow, not next week, but today, get things right. Today is the day of salvation, the scripture says in, in um, over in, uh, I got it here. <laughs> Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, it says, today is the day of, of salvation. You know, folks, for the last several weeks, our pastor has passionately poured out his heart in preaching about the importance of having our minds focused back on, on God, renewing of the minds. My question to you this morning is, as Israel, as they failed back and forth, they, they went back and forth before, you know, sort of half-hearted be with God, and then after and not being with God. I'm wondering if God's word has spoken to your situation in the culture that you have in, embraced rather than embracing God's truth. And I'm wondering, has your heart been pierced with the truth of God's word and have you determined to repent? Have you determined to turn, turn that around? Every time Israel called out to God, God heard and he responded. He sent deliverers for them. He sent somebody to help lead them out of their disgusting ways. And dear friend, he can do the same thing for you today. He does the same thing because today, the scripture says, is the day that God wants you to, to, to decide. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden his, your heart. See, when we are to hear his voice, it's in the time accepted. It's in the day that we hear it. We're to respond in faith. See, today can be a start fresh with God. Today can be a new beginnings. Today can be a time to stop refusing to yield to what God's word has to say and to do what, what God's word teaches you and what you know in your heart. You know, Pastor talked about this phrase, cognitive dissonance. You remember what that what means? It's when we know what's right, but our behavior is different. Cognitive dissonance. When we allow the truth of God's word to permeate our hearts and we determine to obey what God's word, despite the consequences, despite how what other people will think, despite what our heart is telling us, because our, our mind says, this is what God's word says. Today's the time to make things right with God. When we put off doing what we know is right, there's always this gnawing in our hearts and our minds. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, you know, you just know when you know when you know. That's the evidence that there's disobedience that's convicting and keeps us from really resting in his love. In the book of Hebrews, it talks there about this rest. Many of Israelites did not receive the rest because of the disobedience wonder if you're here today and you don't have rest in your heart and mind because of things that you know, you know God has been dealing with your heart about but you've not been willing to let go of them. You know, to quote Abilene in the help, I'd ask you, ain't you tired, friend? Ain't you tired? What's the answer to that? 
I believe it's found in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, the very rest that Israel wanted was found in God. They could have had that had they chosen to continue to obey. And dear friend, you can have that same rest in Jesus Christ today. When there's not fighting, there's not bickering going on, there's not, you're not accusing God of, of not being good to you because of all the, these things that have happened in your life, but you're saying, God, I don't understand it, but God, I trust you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You know, God's not that kind of a, a ogre type of a God that uh, many times the media and other people portray him that he just wants to get us and just try to jab us and because we do something wrong and he does this to us and does that to us. That's not, that's not the God of the Bible. He's a God of love. He's a God of righteousness. He's a God that he created you. He knows all about you and he knows all about me. But he's gentle and he's lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. See, have you ever had a closet at home that you just threw all of your junk into, all of your clutter. And if you're not careful, you go to open that door sometime, it can all come down on you. I think many times we're just like that. We allow all that clutter of disobedience before God. And sometimes the, the, the earliest, the smallest little trick on, on the door handle, we, we're like this, and it comes down falling on us. And we're devastated and we think, where is God? He's, he's never left. He's never left. As a matter of fact, he's right there in the pain. Pastor mentioned this morning, God wastes nothing. It's become one of my favorite quotes from that favorite son-in-law. <laughs> God wastes nothing. In your grief, in your pain, in your heartache, in your physical pain, in, in the, your trials that you go through, in your decisions about your marriage and to be pure and to be holy and be honest before God. God wastes nothing. See, becoming a follower of Christ and learning from him, maybe today you want to throw off all the evidence that there is to convict you of unfaithfulness. Israel was very unfaithful. But they turned to God. Maybe you could be like Israel today and turn to God and say, God, you've pinpointed this in my life. This is what I've got to do. I can't tell you that. I might suspect something, but I don't know your heart. God does. And I'm thankful that he, folks, praise God that he alone is the one who, who is our judge. And we can trust him and praise him for that. But there's an, another verse in, verse in 11, Romans 11 that's, that I, I just love. The goodness and the severity of God. Oh, he is so good. He is so righteous. He is so loving to us. But he's also a severe God. And it's like, today is the day. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a present help in times of trouble. He can be your help today. I love the song that we sang this morning. He is the way, the truth, the life. Would you be, this morning be willing to say before God and before the church family here today, God, there are things in my life I need to take care of. And God, today, I'm not going to put it off. I'm going to obey today so my heart doesn't become any more hardened. Because every day that we don't do what God wants us to do. It can, it can grow harder and harder and harder. If God has spoken to your heart in the last several weeks, and maybe today, maybe this week, I don't know what the situation has been for you. I would beg of you, get it right today. Do what God says. Forget what anyone else says. Do what God says, and you'll be blessed. Let's bow before him. Can you pray? Father, we bow before you, and Lord, we know that your word is always true. You're always good, and you always know just what we need. 
And Father, you address all the issues of our lives. And Lord, I praise you and thank you for that. And Father, this morning, I pray for our people. Father, I pray that as the word of God has been given, Father, that the spirit of God will continue to use it as a sharp edge tool in the hearts to cause surgery to take place, Father, that's necessary. Father, we want to be a, be a church that, that honors you and to, to serve people. But Father, we can't do it until we are right with you. So Father, I pray that you would just continue your work of your ministry. And Father, may your spirit of God just move mightily upon our midst this morning. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Dad. Won't you stand with me for just a moment? And in this moment of quiet, for just a moment, I sense the Holy Spirit moving here upon hearts. As Pastor Dad was teaching, I know the Holy Spirit was moving and convicting and, and doing spiritual surgery in our hearts. With your eyes closed and your head raised, maybe you're here today, I want to give you an opportunity to lead you in a prayer. If you're here and you say, Roger, I have never given my life to Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I'm going to ask you that question right now. Then I'm going to ask you a second in just a moment. But if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ and you say, I, I want to receive his grace, I want to receive his mercy, right where you're at, it's going to happen. Will you slip your hand up in the air right now? I want to see your hand. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today. I see one hand up to my right. Anyone else want to raise their hand up? Second, you're here to say, Roger, I know Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I've been running from him, and I need to come home. I need to come. I need to, as, he, as Pastor Dad was teaching, I need to give my life back to God, and I need to make a change. I need to turn around. I need to quit doing the things that God's pointed out. I need to recommit my life to God and repent. Will you raise your hand with me right now? Hands all over the building here today. I see those hands all over. Thank you in the middle. Thank you on the left. Thank you on the right. In the back, I see the hands. Thank you up front. Thank you in the middle. Thank you in the front row. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I need to make a recommitment to the Lord today. I see you. The Lord sees you both. Yes, I see you right in the third row. I see you. Anyone else? Amen. With your heads raised, your eyes closed, pray with me. Say, Father, I turn my back on everything that you have pointed your finger on. And I turn my heart to you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, that you are alive and risen from the dead. You said in your word, if I confess my sin, you're faithful and you are righteous to forgive it and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I confess my sin before you. I confess my shortcomings before you, and I receive your forgiveness. I receive your righteousness. Do in my life your purpose and your plan. I give my life to you. Give your life to me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to do what I cannot do in my own strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Someone say yes to that. Hallelujah. I am not going to even talk about the offering today. God knows the needs of Exalt Church. I want the service, the message, the worship to be our gift to you. Know this, that those that are grieving this week, we love you. We're praying for you. Our posture, our heart is open to you. We stand with you. We have a pastoral team that's here to love you and serve you. We've got people without titles here that are here to love you and to serve you. Amen. We love you so very much. I wish you a great day. Go in God and remember this. Jesus Christ is Lord and Jesus Christ is alive. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.